Welcome to another edition of Reaching Out. Today, for the first time, we have a very special guest, Congressman Tom Swazi, representing the third congressional district in New York for a third term. He is a member of the Powerful Ways and Means Committee, the oldest committee in Congress. Congressman Swazi is also the founding member and co-chair of the newly formed House Labor Caucus. Currently, Swazi's efforts to fully restore state and local uh, deductions, a tax break that was in place to help middle-class families living in high-income areas. Congressman Swazi has been a public servant for 25 years and previously served as mayor of his hometown, Vinco. Congressman Tom Swazi, welcome to Reaching Out. Hey, how you doing, Mr. President? Great to see you, and uh, thanks for having me on your show. I haven't seen you in a while. It's great to see you in person, or uh, by Zoom, I should say. I'm doing fine. Uh, you, you have a cousin that was at the time when I visited Glen Cove. Uh, he was the mayor, and he was showing me a nice, um, I would say, diagram of a waterfront that he was going to um, have commissioned, and that was about 10 years ago, and he said it would take 10 years. So with my clock, I said, it must be 10 years. How's that progressing? Going great. I st actually started that 25 years ago when I was mayor of Glen Cove. So just so you know, my father was born in Italy. My father uh, was actually discriminated against as an Italian. He was the first kid in the neighborhood to go to college. He fought in World War II as a navigator on a B-24. And then he came back and went to Harvard Law School on the GI Bill, but he couldn't get a job at a law firm because he was Italian. Because everybody thought all the Italians were either mafia or fascist because Mussolini had teamed up with Hitler in those days. So he went back to Glen Cove. The reason I'm telling you this is he became the youngest judge in the history of New York State, city court judge at 28 years old. And then he was the mayor of Glen Cove. Then my uncle was the mayor of Glen Cove. Then I was the mayor of Glen Cove. And then my cousin was the mayor of Glen Cove. So, uh, and so we've all been involved in a lot of different things, but the waterfront project, which I started 25 years ago, cleaning up polluted properties, brought in lots of money from the feds and state, is now being developed as a, really one of the premier waterfront uh, residential and park-like uh, settings anywhere on the North Shore of Long Island. That's fascinating. When it's completed, I'd like to come out and see the finished product. You come right away. Come right away. I'll take you to take you out to lunch. Okay. You, you, you're on. So let me ask you, can you tell us about your role as the vice chair of the newly formed Labor Caucus? I'm the co-chair of the Labor Caucus. And... Uh, Listen, the Democrats, uh, when I was growing up, when you were growing up, I'm, I'm 58 now. I was born in 1962. You're, you're, you're much younger than me. But... Uh, only by a few months. I was born yeah. in 63. Oh, you were? Yes. So when I was born and when I was growing up, you know, the Democrats were for the working people and the Republicans were for the fat cats. And that's just the way it was. Now that's been blurred because of a lot of the social issue stuff. And uh, a lot of people, you know, battling with each other. Trump tried, tried to muddy the waters on a lot of these issues. I want to get it back to where the Democrats are recognized as being, we are for the working men and women. And labor is the place to do it. We can get everybody, I think, from the most progressive to the most moderate Democrats and all get on the same page. What can we do to help working men and women so that if you're willing to work hard, you can live the American dream, which is that I work hard in return for my hard work, I make enough money so I can have a house, I can educate my kids, I can have health insurance, and I can retire one day. That's it, that's the whole story. Work hard, hard work gets rewarded. What's the best example of that? Unions. That's where that happens in America. That's where the middle class was built. And we take unions for granted in New York because you know every public employee is in the union, 20% of private sector people are, are, are in the union. But in the rest of the country, you wouldn't believe how, how anti-union some of my colleagues are. I mean, it's like, it's like, First of all, in America, only 20 or 30% of public employees are unionized, okay? So we think like every teacher, every firefighter, every sanitation worker is in the union. Well, not in America. A lot of teachers are not even unionized in America. And in the private sector, only 6% of employees are unionized. So we need to get back to hard work gets rewarded with enough money and benefits so you can live a decent life. So in our country, uh, we've created enormous wealth since the 1980s. Remember the 1980s when uh, you, you know, we were worried about the Japanese and the Germans taking over the car companies and you know, we were all terrified and we, you know, they beat up the unions, they beat up the car unions. 
Well, since the 1980s, we've created enormous wealth in the country. The Dow Jones has got up 15 times, 1,500%. The GDP has gone up 800%, eight times. But workers' wages have gone up less than 20%. We created a lot of wealth, but we didn't share it with the working men and women of our country. That's where Trump came from. That's where Bernie Sanders came from. That's where the whole idea of everybody being so angry is. So I wanted, I wanted to help form this labor caucus to get us back together on a basic message. You want to look at immigration? You want to look at climate change? You want to look at uh, any issue? Look at it through the lens of labor. How is this going to affect working men and women? Yes. Uh, who are some of the other members of your labor caucus? Well, there's 110 members right now. Uh, it's getting very, very popular. We're going to try and get everybody, quite frankly, in the Democrat side, certainly. We may open it up to Republicans at some point. There's a few Republicans that are good on, on labor issues. You know, they talk a good game, but when it comes to the votes, there's only like eight or 10 Republicans that vote with us. Uh, but the co-chairs are, it's a very diverse group. I started this idea with me and an African-American guy from Nevada named Stephen Horsford, very close to the Unite Union. Um, then I started talking to other people and they're like, well, they had, they had a, a similar type of caucus, but not straight out labor, uh, with a woman named Linda Sanchez, who was in local, uh, electricians unions. She was in the central labor council. She's from California. Yeah, that's, um, her sister was in Congress too and ran for yeah. governor. Yeah. Yeah. Ran for Senator. Yeah. And then, uh, Debbie Dingle, who's from uh, Michigan, she's big with the car companies, uh, and the car, car unions, I should say. And then I got Donald Norcross over in New Jersey, who's an electrician. And I got uh, uh, Mark Pocan, who is a, a painter, who is in the Painters Union from Wisconsin. So we got this very geographically diverse, racially diverse, men and women diverse, a group of people uh, that are all working together, uh, you know, progressive to moderate, all working together to say, what can we do to push labor unions again. And the president is the best that you could ask for. I mean, he's the first president actually saying the word union. The president wants, you know, they used to say about Franklin Roosevelt, the president wants you to join the union. I think that you're going to see that with Joe Biden too. You know, he, he announced his whole jobs plan at a, at a union union hall. You know, he's talking, he, he sent out a video in favor of the, the Amazon organizing down in Alabama. So we can really count on him. And so this labor caucus, you know, we, we got to, we, we got to get, members of the Congress, who are very diverse, to be talking to the members of labor, which are very diverse. It's a very big difference between the building trades and the, you know, the, 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 the hotel workers union. And the, yeah. the very big difference to the public employee versus the car workers union. So we got to figure out how to get all on the same page. So we had Trumpka and Randy Weingarten as our first kickoff speakers. We had Mary Kay Henry from the uh, 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 SEIU, we talk about minimum wage. We had uh, 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 Stuart Applebaum talk about the organizing down in, the, uh, of, uh, down in um, Alabama with Amazon. And we had other speakers come and speak as well. And you know, now we're having the building trades come and speak to us next week. About the co-chairs are actually, I think I'm meeting today with the Secretary of Labor, with Marty Walsh, with the co-chairs, to see what we can do to work together. Very good. Uh, listen, the House passed a PRO Act and it's been endorsed by President Biden. What exactly is the PRO Act and what's happening with it now? I mean, the bottom line is we haven't passed any pro-labor legislation in Washington, D.C. since 1935. Okay, it's the same stuff, and a lot of it's been weakened. So a lot of times, you know, organizing is just very difficult to do because there's too many advantages that the management has. And organizing new unions is very hard to do. We just saw that what happened with Amazon down in Alabama. And even when the management will break the rules, they only get a slap on the wrist when they go before the NLRB, so the National Labor Relations Board. So the PRO Act is to really just make it easier to organize and to make it more of a fair playing field. And so we got, we, the Labor Caucus was very involved. We helped to whip the votes. We actually got more votes this time than they did last time they passed it. But now we gotta get it through the Senate. Now, getting into the Senate is not easy. We only got 50 Democrats plus Kamala Harris, 51. Uh, this cannot be passed by what they call reconciliation. It's got to be done. You got to get 60 votes and, you know, getting 10 Republicans out of the Senate on, on a pro-labor initiative is not an easy thing to do. There's a lot of uh, negotiating going on. Chuck Schumer is pushing hard for it, but it's very hard to get something like this over the finish line. So we just need to make it easier, fairer, 
for people to organize so we can get more unions. To I think the key to America's middle class rebuilding in this country, sharing the wealth we create with the people that are work every day is through unions. And I think it's frankly, frankly the key to the future of the Democratic Party. Uh, and I think it, we, we just got to get our act together and get back. I, I remember when I first got elected to Congress, you know, you said I was the mayor of my hometown for eight years. I was a county executive for Nassau County for eight years. I ran for governor against Elliot Spitzer, got my butt kicked in the Democratic primary. Didn't turn out too well for Elliot Spitzer either. <laughs> so. Uh, Don't make him. <laughs> so uh, I just think that, I just think that we, have to, we have to get back on, on, the, on the, where labor and Democrats are 100% aligned. Where everything we do is looking at how, any legislation we pass, how is it gonna affect working men and women? Okay, now something that's really dear to my heart because I've been crying about this for the last three years, going on for, you have been very vocal about restoring the state and local tax deduction, referred to as SALT deductions. Could you explain to those the, about the deductions and what the status is right now? So what I'm saying is no SALT, no deal. So what happened was in 2017, when the Republicans passed their big tax bill, President Trump signed it into law, included amongst that, they gave all these big cuts cuts to the richest people in America, the corporations, everybody else. They also capped the deduction for your state and local taxes. That was a body blow to New York State and other similarly situated blue states. And they knew that's what it was. They knew it hurt the blue states. It's been a plan for 40 years by the conservative movement, by the Heritage Foundation, those groups, to take away the salt deduction. What does it do? It says, Instead of being able to deduct your property taxes and your state income taxes that you pay or your city income taxes you pay from your tax return, you now can only deduct up to $10,000. Well, you know, everybody pays, you know, 10, 15, $20,000 in property taxes. And then on top of that, you get state income taxes. So it's way more than $10,000. This is hurting a lot of people. And what I, one of the things I keep on saying to my Democratic colleagues who think this is just to benefit rich people is that you know if you're a union member in New York State, let's say you're you're a teamster and a teacher, you know you're making one hundred fifty thousand dollars in your household. We like that, okay? But your taxes are over twenty something thousand dollars, twenty five thousand dollars a year. You should. Why should you have to pay taxes, federal taxes, on the taxes you've already paid? If you're making one hundred fifty thousand, they say, oh, one hundred fifty thousand dollars, you must be rich. Well, you're not rich in New York if you're one hundred fifty thousand dollars. You're middle class. So $150,000 in New York is very different than $150,000 in Oklahoma. In Oklahoma, you make $150,000. You know, you, you're, you're born in the country club. You live in a, in a gated community. $150,000 in New York, you know, you're living an okay life. You're getting by. You're paying your bills. You're, you know, that gives you the, some freedom so you can coach Little League and join the volunteer fire department if you want to. But it doesn't mean you, you, you're living on easy street. You're making $150,000 in North Dakota, you're – Top of the world, you know, you got a new house with granite countertops. That doesn't happen if you live in, in my district or in, in downstate New York, anywhere in the city, anywhere in Nassau or Suffolk or Westchester. I mean, it's, you're, you're getting by. So we got to get the salt deduction back, not only to help the people that go to work every day and who have these high taxes in higher income areas like New York and New Jersey and Connecticut and Massachusetts and Illinois and California and Michigan and all the blue states, but also because we don't want the rich people leaving New York. If you're a wealthy person living in New York, you left during the pandemic, you maybe went down to Florida or maybe you went out to some other place. And now you're like, well, I can re work remotely. I can work uh, on Zoom. I can, you know, I don't have to be in New York City. I'm gonna keep a calendar that shows I'm not in New York City for six months and one day. We don't want those rich people leaving us because if they leave, if they leave New York, who gets left behind holding the bag? The middle class and lower income people that either have to get their taxes raised to make up the difference, or they gotta get their services cut. So we don't want that. Now, this is the first deduction, the state and local tax deduction was the first deduction in the federal income tax code. It was set up in 1913, because we didn't want the long arm of the federal government coming in and saying, governors, mayors, local officials, we're gonna take that money away from you. We wanna give, we want the, the states and the cities to be the laboratories of democracy. Why does it cost more in New York? It costs more in New York because we have the lowest rate of uninsured children. We've got a mass transit system that's the best in the world. That's uh, uh, 
We've got the lowest carbon footprint of any city in the world, just about, because uh, we do, th we have union employees, uh, because we do things that are progressive. Those things all cost more money. We think it makes our lives better. We think it makes us more productive. The federal government should not be creating a race to the bottom that people say, oh, I can save money if I live, live, move to the state. Uh, let me move to Texas where they, you know, they don't even have regulated utilities. They had that whole shutdown of their electric system because they don't, in Florida, they got red tide, you know, growing it in their waterways because they don't even have sewers. You know, they, they don't insure their children. They don't insure, they don't have unions, so, so forth. Uh, I'm, I'm talking too much, but. You no, did. you're not. You're here. That's what you're here to do. Inform and talk. Uh, you're listening to Reaching Out. I'm Gregory Floyd, President of Local 237. Our very special guest is Congressman Tom Swazi of the 3rd Congressional District in New York. And he's just talking about the, uh, the tax deductions and why we um, need the state and local tax deduction restored. Um, raising the minimum wage is another thing that has been discussed. In your opinion, what will happen and what's involved? Well, listen, let's talk about the minimum wage first. I mean, you know, the federal minimum wage, this is hard to imagine. People are shocked when they hear this. It's seven twenty-five an hour, okay? So now in New York, you know, we've got $15 minimum wage pretty much most places. Uh, but, I mean, think about it, seven twenty-five an hour. Let's say it was $10 an hour, which it's not. $10 an hour, you work 40 hours a week, you work 50 weeks a year, you get two weeks vacation. How much do you make? $20,000 a year. You get twenty thousand dollars a year. You're gonna buy health insurance. You're gonna educate your kids. You're gonna buy a house. You're gonna retire. I don't think so. Fifteen dollars an hour. Fifteen dollars an hour. Forty hours a week. Fifty weeks a year. That's thirty thousand dollars. You're gonna you're gonna do all those things. I don't think so. So the Democrats are saying we gotta pass a fifteen dollar minimum wage. Uh, one or two Democrats in the Senate is saying no, and a lot of Republicans are saying no. So we got a fight on our hands. So I was talking to some, like a bipartisan group today and they're saying we should do an $11 minimum wage. I say, well, listen, I would support the $11 minimum wage if you do it on the same calendar that they were gonna do the $15 minimum wage. So, you know, it wouldn't just jump right from 725 to $15 right away, be over a period of years. Well, let's follow the same track for the next two or three years to get us to $11 a minimum wage, and then we'll fight over the 11, make it get the 15 after that or so along the way. But let's raise it now, let's stop fighting with each other. Let's just get it raised right away. You know, not, not, not say $11 an hour five years from now, but we'll make it $11 a year two years from now, at least get it up higher. So it's very different, you know, we take it for granted in New York again, because we got it, labor unions in Alabama, how will this affect the people that, uh, uh, you know, they'd be ecstatic to get it up to $10 an hour, $11 an hour. Uh, so, you know, we should get what we can and lift everybody up in the process and then fight for more and just keep organizing. But there's just a lot of people, I mean, seven twenty five an hour, I mean, $10 an hour, 20,000 a year, and you're working 40 hours. You know, say you work 50, 50 hours, I mean, you work hard. There's too many people in America today. The reason people are so upset, there's so much anger, too many people go to work every day. They're working hard, but they can't make it. They're working two jobs. You know, they're working 80 hours a week or 60 hours a week or 80 jobs. They can't make it. It's impossible. So we got to get to that basic message. I mean, during the pandemic, we saw the richest people in America went from the, 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 bill, the billionaires in America went from $2.6 trillion of wealth to $4.5 trillion dollars in wealth during the pandemic, just one year. So listen, I don't begrudge anybody making a lot of money. I'm good, you're creative, you're competitive, you're capitalist. Good, I'm happy, happy for you. But 25% of the people who make under $40,000 a year are still unemployed. So how do we make it so that we share the success with the people who go to work every day? I, I, I'm convinced more than ever, I've always been pro-union, but after being in Washington, I'm like you know crazy pro-union because it's like the only way we're gonna ever actually get it, that people who go to work every day get to share the wealth is by being organized. And we gotta get back to the basics. Don't mourn, organize. So that's what I'm, you know, we're, we're, gonna, be going, we're gonna be going out to all, uh, not all, but a bunch of congressional districts uh, and Linda Sanchez and I, and we're gonna be talking to the labor unions in their districts. Because when I first got elected in 2016 to Congress, came in in 2017, I'll never forget, I went to a meeting 
and a guy from, uh, I think he was a, I, he may have been a team star. I, I can't remember what he was now. Even if he was in the carpenter, I can't remember. But he said, you know, in the old days, the Democrats, you'd see him at the church picnic and you'd see him at the bars. Now we don't see him anymore. Well, that, we got to get back to the basic, just talking to people and figuring out what's going on in their lives and helping them to, to live a, a, a decent life. That's why the American Rescue Plan is so great. I mean, you know, checks in people's pockets, shots in people's arms. This child tax credit is coming out. It's a huge thing. You can get $3,000 for every kid between 6 and 17. You get $3,600 for every kid from 0 to 3. If you make it up to $150,000 a year, you get the full amount. If you got three kids, you, you know, get $10,000. So we got to do more things that are not just talking about stuff, but actually doing real stuff that helps people. Congressman? Yeah, those who are listening who want reciprocity on that. <laughs> what do they want? Tell me what they want. We want reciprocity. <laughs> we want to pay for the kids that we had already. We got it, Greg. You missed the boat. <laughs> you think you got it bad. Think about me. I'm a straight white man in the Democratic Party. It's over for me. I was born 15 years too early. Wow. <laughs> so, listen, listen, no, I'm, I've been fortunate. So I'm, I'm just saying, uh, yeah, we need to help a lot of people because the person you help helps you in the future because that means you have less people who are mad. You have more children who are educated. They're doing something. And it's like uh, an episode of Spider-Man. I remember when Spider-Man, what, what taught me was when I was watching the Spider-Man episode, Spider-Man didn't think it was his job to help anyone because he had these powers. The person that he didn't help, the criminal got away and ended up killing his uncle. Yeah. So everything is relevant. The person you don't help today it's the person that ends up coming back to hurt you. That's so that's right. a lesson. So we need to help everybody, help, help um, uh, families, because when they grow up, they're productive. And you know what? They're not in jail. They're not, not harming society. And may, may be the person that may harm you in the future. So everything's connected. That's so. funny. You bring up Spider-Man. I used to say to my daughter, you know, when she was a little girl, I forget what it was, but I was getting beaten up for something. Even though I was trying to help people, I was getting beaten up politically. And, I, and she said, why, Daddy, why are they saying that about you? I said, you know how Spider-Man is always trying to do the right thing, but sometimes people think he's a bad guy? She said, yeah. yeah. I said, Daddy's just like Spider-Man. <laughs> <laughs> that, that works, that works. So listen, we have uh, one minute left because uh, I know you have to go and the show is going to end. Is there anything that you want to mention to our listeners before we leave? Listen, I'm gonna do everything I can to help New York, help our people, bring money back to New York through the American Rescue Plan, fight for salt, fight for working men and women, fight for labor unions. Uh, I'm just, I'm, I'm so honored to be in public service. I mean, I was, I was in for a long time and I lost my races, I was out. I'm just happy to be in public service. I'm glad I've devoted my life to it. It's very fulfilling and I'm grateful for the opportunity and the honor uh, to be in this job. I got a big responsibility during these tough times. Uh, we got a lot to do. Uh, but I'm in for the in for the long haul, and I really appreciate the help that you've given me, uh, Greg, and the Teamsters have given me. And uh, I'm going to always be, as my grandmother used to say, you like a me, I like a you. So I'm going to keep on working hard to help you, and I appreciate the help you've given me over the years. Thank you, and thank you. And we're going to invite you to come back on Reaching Out, and we, we hope when you come back you will have solved the state and local taxes because that will help the rest of us. That's right. Uh, no salt, no deal. You've been listening to Reaching Out. I'm Gregory Floyd, President of Local 237. Our very special guest was Congressman Tom Swazi from the 3rd Congressional District in New York. Thank you for being on Reaching Out. Thanks, Greg. Have a great day.